Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the State of the Fandom, a furry fandom podcast. And uh, here I have with me my better half, Labs. The puppy, yes, hello. Labs the puppy is here. Uh, my name is Neil Fox, and you can find me on TikTok, on Twitter, on all your favorite platforms. I used to go by the term draw ponies, uh, but that was a very, very long time ago and seems like another life. But uh, today our topic is uh, one of the most angering, one of the most controversial topics in the entire furry fandom, and that is Kiro the Wolf. Uh, do you know anything about Kiro the Wolf? I don't know much, actually, so this will be a ride for me as well. Yes, uh, a ride indeed. Uh, well, so full disclosure, uh, when I was the CEO of Artwork T, which, you know, I stepped down in 2020, but, you know, this, all of the hullabaloo around Kira the Wolf happened before I stepped down from Artwork T. So, uh, I was actually working with him at the time when everything went down. So when all of the stuff was exposed, all the chat logs, all of that. And, uh, I'd have a really difficult conversation with him because at that time, nobody knew what was true. Because, you know, this is literally the first day after all of this comes out. And so I didn't know what was true. Nobody on the internet knew what was true. There were all kinds of accusations of like, oh, it's fake. You know, somebody faked these chat logs and all of this. And they're framing him. And I mean, that's what he was saying himself was, oh, I was framed. So uh, I had have a really difficult conversation with him. And I said, look, man, I like, I don't know whether or not this stuff is true, but whether or not it is, uh, it looks bad for Artwork T for you to even be accused of it. So we're just going to take down your listings. I'm going to look through everything and figure out what is true and what's not. And then I, I will make a decision of whether or not you can stay on the platform. And he was like, okay, well, I understand. You know, it's, I didn't, he, according to him, he's like, oh, well, I didn't do anything wrong. And I, yeah, well, yeah, anyway, he still claims that to this day. <laughs> but, uh, and also just so that my lawyer can sleep a little bit better at night. All of this, this entire podcast from here on out is allegedly he did these things. These yes. were not proven in a court of law, but in my opinion, and this is only an opinion, uh, the evidence is so strongly uh, against him that in my opinion, it is things that he did. But this is all alleged and opinion. So uh, where would you like to start with the story of Kira the Wolf? Uh, start with a major controversy and then uh, wind it back from there? Absolutely. So, uh, the big controversy about Kira the Wolf is that he is accused of some just absolutely despicable acts, including zoophilia and uh, what's called zoo sadism. So, this is one of those things that, like, I'm, I'm a relatively relatively like uncomplicated when I when I when I talk about what I like on the internet to 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 whack off to you know I I am a chubby chaser that is who I am I that it's I've always been that way uh but sometimes I come across on the internet a fetish that I even I have never heard of despite the fact that I have been on the internet for quite a long time uh with with unrestricted internet access. Uh, and what do you know, having sex with roadkill was a fetish that I had never heard of before. Neither have I. Oh, you've never heard of it before? Oh. No! So it's zoo sadism. So it's, uh, it means uh, sex with animals, and then sadism, it means that the pain and suffering of the animal is part of the arousal for these people. Huh. It's it's horrible. Uh, it it is as soon as I heard of it as like I said I learned about what it is through having to research whether or not Kiro did it or not. And like I remember looking through all the chat logs and all the evidence and all of that, and just getting like my stomach was in knots and all of this because it's horrible. Like for those listeners out there, please. Do not look up the chat logs, please, because there are, 
uh, they're, they're very small because they're like thumbnail sized images, but there are actual pictures of the acts that were performed and they are horrible. Like there's, there's literally chat logs of Kiro himself on his main account that he used for his YouTube channel, like on his Telegram account he used to contact me as his merch sponsor, uh, to contact other people in the furry fandom. Like it, there's no question it was him. Uh, it, it was him, unless someone stole his phone and wrote under his name. It was him. Uh, the, the, there's chat logs of him saying, like, oh, yeah, you know, that roadkill fox I saw earlier today, you know, that was so hot. Oh, I really wanted to, you know, fuck his throat and all this. And I'm just like, oh, God. Oh, God. oh my God. It's so disgusting. <laughs> Why? Yeah. So there are several different players in the story. Uh, one of them is someone named Snake Thing, or that's how, what they went by on Telegram. And so Snake Thing is actually the reason why we have these lovely, just balls of sunshine of chat logs to go through. So uh, uh, Snake Thing apparently was not the brightest bulb in the. Uh, in the box. In the Christmas tree. Not the brightest bulb in the Christmas tree. And uh, so he... (laughs) Apparently uh, gave his Telegram login to one of his friends. Genius. 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 (laughs) Legendary uh, genius. So this is why we, we have all these forwarded messages and chat logs from Snake Thing direct, direct messages with Kiro the Wolf. And uh, these messages are very personal. Like, one of the reasons why I made the decision uh, in, you know, 2019 or whatever it was, I think it was 2019. It's like early 2019. Uh, One of the reasons why I made the decision at the time that I thought the evidence was real was that it was all very personal conversations. So, you know, talking about, you know, oh, I feel depressed today, or oh, I feel anxious about this, and even, <laughs> this this is the part that just breaks my heart to read, or broke my heart to read all those years ago. Like, despite the fact that I've only read these things once, and then immediately deleted them from my computer, because it is literally illegal content, uh, the, uh, it just broke my heart to read these things, of like, uh, at one point, he messages, Kiro messages Snake Thing, and uh, says, you know, I really don't feel good about this fetish. Like, I, obviously, I have this fetish. It's just part of who I am. But I don't think that this is the right thing to do. And so I'm going to quit. And Snake Thing, being the absolute trash human being that he is, uh, responds and says, oh, well, you know, it's, it's fine. The animals are dead. It's not like they can feel anyway. And, uh, you know, you'll be back, you'll be back. They always come back. And I'm just like, oh my God. And as you're reading this, you get this like hope for Kiro. Like, oh, oh, maybe he, oh, maybe he, maybe he actually did the right thing. Maybe he actually did the right thing. And then literally less than a week later in the chat log, he's like, hey guys, I'm back. And this is like a group where they were all in. And he's like, hey guys, I'm back. And they're like, oh, we knew you would come back. We knew you'd come back. And it's like, no. (laughs) So anyway, uh, I definitely had a time reading these chat logs. Uh, Even though I only read them once and I read them, you know, now it's been three or four years ago. I still remember vividly some of the pictures and images. So. Uh, like I said, to, to summarize the story thus far, he was accused of acts of both sadism, zoophilia, etc. And he says in these chat logs, very unambiguously that he did it. Like he's, he's talking with his friend, Snake Thing, who has been convicted of animal abuse, by the way. So Snake Thing is in jail, from what I understand. Uh, for animal abuse, for, you know, having sex with animals and torturing them and all of this. Uh, At the time when Snake Thing was doing these things, it was not illegal in the country where he lived. He lived in the country of Cuba, 
But ah. the, the genius decided to move to America, where his actions were and are illegal. Uh, again, all of this is alleged. I am not a lawyer. I am not a court. I cannot uh, prove or disprove anyone's innocence. But to me, the evidence is so strong that it is uh, pretty obvious who did what. But anyway, so to summarize the story thus far, all of this comes out on Twitter, on YouTube. People start talking about it. And uh, several large, like high-profile YouTubers make videos about it. Uh, which ones? Uh, well, if I remember correctly, let me actually look it up just because I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, if I just search Kiro the Wolf on YouTube, Kiro the Wolf, uh, there is uh, Turkey Tom, who made a video one month ago, 700,000 views. Never heard of him. Uh, Cecil McFly, this person has just one of the largest, uh, video series on Kira the Wolf. Millions of views. Uh, Kira the Wolf actually made a, uh, made a YouTube video one year ago saying that he was back and telling his side of the story. And, um, that has over 160,000 views. Uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, Deadwing Dork, uh, I think you mentioned that you listened to his channel, The Bear, remember? I think you mentioned you listened to it's him. It's Bearwin. Yeah. Bearwin's the one I listened to. Yeah. Oh, Bearing. Bearing. Be Bearing. B-E-A-R-I-N-G. I think he covered Kira the Wolf, I don't remember. Maybe. Is Bearing a furry, or is he just... B-E-A-R-I-N-G. Bearing. Yeah. Uh, it looks like he has not talked about Cure the Wolf. But the, the point is that this is a topic that many people have discussed. It's all public record, especially the stuff that was covered by the court in the court case. So I'm not revealing any, you know, whole little secret, excuse me, secret information other than my personal experience, which it's not a secret. It's just I haven't talked about it yet. But, uh, so... All this stuff comes out, people start talking about it online, especially on Twitter and YouTube, and Kiro basically just goes silent. He goes completely silent, and then he says that he was hacked. He says he was hacked in an infamous screenshot, and uh, people notice that uh, oh, his, his telegram was hacked, quote-unquote. And people notice that uh, his, um, his screenshot that he posted had a little logo of a VPN in the top right-hand corner. So what it appears that he did was he installed a VPN so that he could make it look like he was no longer logged into his Telegram account. So he makes a new Telegram account where he starts messaging people, oh, I didn't do it, I'm innocent, none of this stuff is true, and, uh, yeah, no, people rip that to shreds. <laughs> ah. But, uh, his, his version of events is he had a dog. Yep. Uh, he, you know, that, that was not under dispute. He posted plenty of pictures of it on his public Twitter and all of this. And, uh, his dog passed away from kidney failure. And... Oh, puppy. Yes, very, very unfortunate. Um, you know, that was the official story was, you know, he, the dog passed away from kidney failure. Uh, however, in these private DMs between Kiro and Snake Thing, uh, the dog passes away in the chat log. So, like, during the time that the chat log is, is occurring, uh, the dog passes away. And he's, this is one of the things that, uh, spurs him on to do this this cleanse that I mentioned of like oh I'm not gonna participate in this fetish anymore because he's like yeah I feel really bad and uh, forgive me this has been three or four years since I read these logs so I don't remember the exact words that he uses but uh, he basically says I think that my dog died because of me and so uh, there there's a lot of different memes around Cure the Wolf, around what he did. Uh. But the most the most common meme that you might see is 
uh, Kira raped his dog to death. And uh, that has not been proven one way or the other, but it is probably true. Hmm. Uh, there are videos which he claims were faked. I, who knows? Uh, but there are videos, some of which I unfortunately viewed myself because, uh, again, I was trying to determine whether or not he actually did it. As he was, at the time, he was one of the sellers on the Artwork P website. Like, you know, I, obviously, I'm not going to allow him to continue to sell if he is an animal rapist, obviously. And so I, you know, with feeling like I was going to throw up, had to go through all of this awful crap and uh you know it to me it was unambiguous that it was him in the in the video because you know it's his body type you can see some of his tattoos like tattoos that are underneath his clothes so normally you wouldn't be able to see like his thigh tattoo for example so why would someone go through the trouble of like painting his tattoo on their thigh to frame him like i, I come on uh, so there, there are videos of him, uh, of him doing quite unspeakable acts to this, to this poor dog that later died. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, that is, that is a, uh, summary of what you mentioned before, which is the controversy, controversy, quote unquote, is, uh, he got exposed for doing really, really horrible things to his dog and to, apparently, roadkill animals that he found. Exposed, quote-unquote. He got cancelled on Twitter for raping his dog to death. <laughs> I mean, uh, that seems pretty justified at that point. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, which, you know, I would say maybe even 80% of the time, I don't think that people deserve to get canceled. Uh, you know, I've been canceled probably five times by now, and, you know, the only person, quote-unquote, who was wronged by my tracing in 2015 was Hasbro Corporate, which is a $5 billion corporation, and if they were, if they had any problem with my tracing, uh, the statute of limitations on copyright infringement is three years, so... If anyone would like to build a time machine <laughs> and go back in time to tell Hasbro in uh, 2017 or 2018 what I did and, and get them to file a case against me, they are more than welcome to. Uh, well, if you're building a time machine, can you do something more productive with it, like literally anything else? I, I do find it very funny that there's a, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are upset at me for something I did in 2015, and the statute of limitations ran out on it four years ago. So, even the courts are not upset about it. Even Hasbro is not upset about it. But of course, furries on Twitter are upset about it. You no, know, furries on Twitter just need to get alive. Yeah, sometimes. But anyway, that's uh, that's my personal soapbox about cancel culture. I I oftentimes think especially in the furry fandom, that is not justified. But if we are talking about bullying someone off of Twitter and YouTube, bullying, quote-unquote, if we're talking about uh, canceling them off of Twitter and YouTube because they raped their dog to death, that's, that's definitely justified. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, what other parts of the story are you interested in? Uh, that was the main parts. Uh... Well, there, there's a couple of other things that happened. One is how Kiro got to the point of having 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And because he, he had 100,000, like 105,000 or something like that when all of this came out. So he was, if not the biggest, I think Majira Strawberry had more subscribers, but he was one of the biggest furry YouTubers at that time. Um, he was probably either second or third in terms of number of subscribers behind, uh, I think, Majira and Pakari Roo or something like that. Which, by the way, they were also selling on Artwork Tea at the time. Uh, and, of course, many of them were asking me, like, hey, you know, are you going to take this guy off the site? And I'm like, it's only been four hours. Give me some time to look at this, you know, 
10,000 words of chat logs that have been leaked. Um, because at the time, that was it. There, there was no analysis of the chat logs. There was no, you know, oh, well. Immediately shoot him in the face now. <laughs> right, right. I, I mean, I made my decision within, I think it was within 24 hours. But, like, I looked at it. I thought about it, and then I made my decision of, like, I hope, my decision at the time was, I hope that this is false. I hope that it is a hoax. But the evidence is so strongly stacked against him that I, at the time, and even to this day, I I do not think that it was a hoax. I think that it was real. And one of the reasons why it's probably real and uh, many people have pointed this out not just me but in the chat logs he would use phrases that were similar to things he would say in real life and in his videos so you know he would say things like you know hey hey as a greeting and there's you know 10 or 15 times in the chat logs that it says you know hey hey like to start a conversation and so uh, either someone was a very very talented writer and wrote all of this about him uh, falsely or uh, it was just that was real the world may never know <laughs> I mean like I said it's it seems pretty obvious to me that that it was that it was the truth but uh, he he basically built up a following on YouTube the same way that every other free YouTube content creator does. He did collab videos with people like Majira Strawberry. He did a collab video with Shane Dawson, which was actually one of the things that um, really boosted his channel, was because that video got, I think, like 2 million views or something like that. Shane Dawson, isn't he the one who makes the robots? What? (laughs) No! Uh, Shane Dawson is the one who uh, is like a beauty vlogger, YouTuber. You probably don't know anything about him, I would guess. No. Early, from like 2006, 2007, early days, famous YouTuber who still posts every now and then. Uh, Ironically enough, ironically enough, uh, he made a joke, quote unquote, Jane Dawson made a joke on his podcast uh, about... 15 years ago now, about, oh, excuse me, he, he made a joke about jerking off onto his cat. So, who knows, maybe that was the connection that he and Kiro had. I hope not, and I am not making any claims that can be proven in a court of law. I am just reporting public information that that is what Shane Dawson said on his podcast. <sighs> You seem very quiet, my love. I'm just letting you talk. Well, yes, but that's the whole point of this podcast is to to banter, to ask questions, to make mistakes, to get messy, (laughs) as Miss Frizzle would put it. Uh, Yes. But from knowing you quite well, I would guess that it it seems like you are a bit taken aback by by all of this. Just a little bit. So what, what what is... I mean, it all seems pretty straightforward and clear. Yeah. I, I don't have many questions on something that seems very straightforward and clear. There, there's no ambiguity here. There's just, if I want to go find these logs, I can. Yeah. Again, <laughs> please do not. I don't plan on it. Uh, again, it is illegal to have uh, zoophilia porn yes. of real animals. It is illegal to have that on your computer. And I say of real animals because that is the law of, you know. Yeah. There, there's a lot of crap on fur affinity that I wish I could eye bleach out of my brain. But uh, if it is drawn, so it's the law is similar to that for child pornography. Where if it is drawn, it is technically legal, even though it is disgusting. Whereas if it is a real picture, it is illegal to have that file on your computer. It is. So, not only... Is it just a very bad time for all to download these and read them? But uh, it is illegal to have those images on your computer. Yes. Wait. (laughs) 
uh, he's a very cute puppy and he likes to wail. I do. Now, the other part of the story is what happened following the controversy. So, obviously, uh, many people uh, blamed Snake Thing, for one, because it was obvious from the chat logs that he was, like, encouraging Kiro to do it. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, why don't you try this? And, you know, oh, you know, that's really hot. Make sure you send me videos of you doing this or whatever. And oh, it's, so, <laughs> it's so gross. It's, it's so disgusting. Um, but... Uh, my understanding, and it's been a while since I looked it up, but my understanding is that Snake Thing uh, was convicted in the United States and is now serving quite a long prison sentence for his crimes. Oh, of course. And so, you know, if a person was to say something like, oh, well, a person such as Kiro himself was to say, oh, well, it wasn't proven that I did anything, then, well, why did your close friend that you messaged with every day for months why did he get convicted of these crimes and you did not hmm. Hmm. interesting someone sounds to me like someone had to write a very long book essay to CYA yeah <laughs> a little bit a little bit uh, the, 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 uh, if we're talking about cover your ass CYA yeah the, the ass was very very large that had to be covered because all the crimes that were allegedly committed. No, oh, that it was a very long, very long book essay then. Yes. Uh, and so, following the controversy, he locked down his Twitter. He uh, he made it private, I believe, so nobody could access it. And of course, he lost a lot of subscribers. He lost a lot of Twitter followers. I think he went down by many thousands of followers on each platform, if I recall correctly. And uh, he basically disappeared from the furry internet for a while. He, he made a big public statement uh, a couple of weeks after the fact of, you know, oh, well, people are bullying me and canceling me, and oh, oh isn't this awful? And uh, something that I was particularly sad to see was he tried to deflect blame onto other people of like, yeah. Oh, well, you know, well, you've seen all the horrible things that these people have done. No, I, uh, uh, and yes, it's like, well, they didn't rape their dog to death. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, you know, yes, other people have been canceled in the furry fandom. That doesn't make your actions justified. Uh, I would know about being canceled in the furry fandom. Yes. I've never been canceled in the furry fandom, mainly because I'm controversy free. You are not controversy free. Uh, he so one of the things that we will we will cover on this podcast is uh, the world's favorite topics: religion and politics. Yeah, because he has many. My my dear my dear partner, my better half, Labs has many many opinions about religion, well, politics, yes, their opinions, conspiracy theories that you could get canceled for. I mean, they could try. Yeah, exactly. Will I give a fuck? Probably not. Exactly. Maybe we should have like a uh, maybe we should have like a, a recurring segment of like labs thoughts and it's just you talking about a conspiracy theory or something. I mean religion organized religion itself is heresy, come fight me, but Yes. Again. You know, actually I, as far as controversies go, I've never raped a dog to death. Good! I've never done anything monumentally stupid. I've fucked with cults. And mess with, you know, Furry Valley. But... Oh, yes. Furry Valley, by the way. It's my favorite topic. We will do probably an entire <laughs> series of episodes on Furry Valley. So, Simba, if you're listening, hi. Uh, make hi. sure you send this to Simba if you, uh, if you know him. Uh, but, yes, we will, be, we will be posting all kinds of things about Furry Valley. How would, what would, what would be the name that Furry Valley people would know you by? Oh, my God. She called me Labs. The link, right? On Discord? Yeah, it's Labs. It's Labs on Discord? Yeah. Okay. That's what they would know me by? Got it. So, uh, apparently, if you are associated with him in any way, Simba will ban you from the uh, big furry server, Furry Valley. So, I, I feel sorry for any Furry I Valley know. staff members that would be listening to this, because they're a good band, because they're, they're listening to something that you recorded. I don't care. <laughs> right. Okay, Simba. If you want, 
come at me. If you want to try and cancel me, you've already tried and failed, mind you. Yeah. He doxed me before. He doxed you? Oh, yeah, on God. Kiwi Farms. Jesus. Unfortunately, well, we might be able to link the Kiwi the entire Kiwi Farms uh, thread it post. Yes, we should There's definitely like link it. Two hundred pages. <laughs> two hundred like... pages? Yes. Jesus. Well, there's a there's an episode right there, or a series of episodes. We can just go through the Kiwi Farms post about Free Valley. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Oof. All of it's manufactured by Simba himself at this point. Oh God. Just of course. Because he um. You you always you always know that people who post about themselves on for on a. On Kiwi Farms, There's, those types of people just tend to be the, just the best, just the oh, best yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Simba, <laughs> Simba's posted about himself. He's you know outed himself. Oh, of course. Oh, outed himself. Yeah, he outs other people on there Jesus. as well. He doxes people on there. Wow. Well, and makes it look like people are oh so interested in attacking him. In reality, he's a sad, pathetic loser. That no one really cares about. Oof. That's some hot takes for our episode on Furry Valley. Mm. Well, to finish out our inaugural episode, I suggest that we tell a little bit about our own story. So, oh, which one? Well, I will do myself first, and then you tell your story. Okay. So, my name is Neil Fox. It will be legally changed soon. Uh, it's not my legal name right now, but it will be soon. And uh, I have been part of the furry fandom since 2012, or since 2011, and part of the brony fandom since 2012. And uh, my first, well, claim to fame, quote-unquote, in fandom is uh, I was someone going by the name of Draw Ponies. And uh, I had, for quite a while, the record for uh, most brony conventions attended as an attendee or as a vendor. And uh, there, no one was even close. Like, I had a friend who uh, went by the name Vigilant Watch, and he uh, he owned his own plane, and would fly in his own airplane to Brony conventions. Yes. And I had been to more conventions than him. Like that's how many Brony conventions I went to. And. Uh, it was great. I did some panels at BronyCon. I, my biggest panel ever was one at Equestria LA with about 800 uh, people in attendance. That was a surreal experience. And uh, it, was, it was a fun time. It was a lot of stress. It was a lot of work. But uh, it, was, it was really fun. And uh, unfortunately, I made a very stupid and very regrettable mistake uh, to trace some artwork from the My Little Pony show. Uh, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I've apologized for it many times, including apologizing for it in 2015. But uh, people decided that I was a heretic and should be burned at the stake, despite the fact that about uh, between a third and a half of all pony artists at the time were using the same technique of, you know, just finding poses that they wanted to use from the show and making them into comics or making them into merch or whatever. Uh, you know, not that other people doing a bad thing means that I was right, because I wasn't right. I was wrong. No, you were just... But I was doing the same as my peers, and, and I was the only one who got punished for it. Because you were more successful than everyone else. Oh, yeah. No, people like... Uh, I, I'll have to go through the whole list of, of uh, players in that story. That will definitely be a full episode at the very least, as you know, draw ponies exposed and trace ponies exposed and all of this. Yes. People had lots of fun parodying the name draw ponies by calling me trace ponies. Was, they had a great laugh about it. Of course. And so uh, I decided that I would take this as a uh, as a way to improve myself. Like I, I said, you know, I did the wrong thing, so I'm going to take a break. A lot of conventions canceled my tables anyway, so I didn't have anywhere to go for that convention season. And so I applied to a school called Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art, and I took a uh, nine months of classes there. Didn't end up finishing the 18-month degree uh, because it just got too expensive, but I did nine months there. Uh, it's lafa.org if anyone wants to look it up. Uh, they're still around and still kicking. And... Uh, 
I met some great friends there. Uh, I had some really interesting experiences, and I got a lot of uh, new knowledge about art because up to that point, I was completely self-taught. Uh, you know, a self-taught artist, there's going to be a lot of things you don't know that you know artists have learned over the course of many centuries. <laughs> yeah. And uh, after that, I actually started a company called Artwork Tea, which many people know from uh, my work with Majira Strawberry, with Telephone, with, uh, with a couple of others, including Pineapple Fox and um, Paco Panda and many others that we worked with. Uh, we actually raised over $100,000 for charity in 2019, including through our, um, uh, through our uh, campaign with the Furry Charity Calendar, which I uh, basically did all the work on it. Not, not quite all of it, but the vast majority of work to make that happen was mine. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of money, and so it took us a while to fill all of the orders from the Kickstarters, but we did end up finishing all of them. And uh, the, uh, well, to my knowledge, we finished all of them. If anyone wants to email me and let me know that they didn't get their order, they're more than welcome to so that I can make it right. But anyway, the point is, is that we raised over $100,000 for charity in 2019. And uh, we were going into 2020 really strong. It was going to be a good time. And then COVID happened. Yeah. <laughs> and there were no conventions to go to. So I took some of my uh, experience running small business and I applied for a job as a consultant with a company called Global Resources uh, based out of Chicago. And I was a senior business analyst for them for several months. And uh, it, that was a really difficult job. I, uh, it was a lot of stress, but uh, I learned a lot from it. I went into about 50 different businesses and you know did analysis for them and helped them figure out ways to improve um, how their business functioned. And uh, in June of 2020, unfortunately, I was involved in a car accident, uh, which was very, very severe. I broke my kneecap, my right tibia bone, my sternum bone, and my T10 and T12 uh, vertebrae, all at the same time. Cuts. Uh, to, give you a, to give you an idea, I may not have told you this yet, to give you an idea of the severity of the injury, uh, they come up to the car where I'm there, you know, all beaten up and hurting and all of this and just trying to not die. And uh, they say, okay, we're going to give you some fentanyl. <laughs> I go, what? Fentanyl? Oh, God, no, please. And they're like, no, 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 it's, you need it. We're only going to give you a really tiny amount. It'll be fine. So they, they use a little syringe to put fentanyl in my nose, and nothing. Uh, my, my level of pain did not change after <laughs> receiving the strongest opiate that I know of. That, that, there probably are stronger opiates, but fentanyl is one of the strongest. It is literally used to tranquilize elephants. It is an elephant tranquilizer, and I felt nothing. So they had to close down the entire highway. They closed down both, both ways. They closed down the highway of like eight lanes of traffic, and they landed this giant medical helicopter. And uh, they carried me up the embankment to it, and uh, it, was, oh, it was horrible. But anyway, I uh, got to take my first helicopter ride, which under other circumstances would have been fun. Uh, they did some emergency surgery to fix my leg because my, um, so I have, I have metal rods in all four of my major leg bones, Yes. which you know, but the audience may not know. Wow. And, uh, my right tibia, actually the rod was bent at like a 30 degree angle. Jesus okay. fucking Christ. So, like. Bent titanium. Bent titanium, yes, that's correct. <laughs> and so they did an emergency surgery just to get the leg back in alignment. They didn't actually replace the rod that time. And uh, they put me in a uh, chest brace because I had broken my uh, vertebrae and my sternum. And then I had a cast on my right leg all the way up to my thigh. Aww. And they told me that I would have to wear the chest brace for uh, 12 weeks. Oof. So I was expecting to be out of the leg cast after 
12 weeks. I, I was not expecting to ha still have the leg cast, but unfortunately for me, from whatever they did during the surgery, uh, the leg did not heal properly. Oh. So they looked at it in September, about six months after the accident, and they said, yeah, your leg looks exactly the same as when you came in in June. And uh, that was that was pretty hard to hear. I was, I was pretty suicidal at that point because I had been in a cast for that long. I was going to have to have another major surgery. I didn't know how long it was going to be till I was better. Oh. I was, I was, I was definitely my lowest point. Uh, but I made it through. And one of the ways I made it through was by starting the Has Been Hotel Fan Works YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, I just poured all of my... So they did the surgery on my leg to replace the rod, and the leg started to heal, but that was a long process. I think I was in the cast still two months after that. So I was in bed. I had nothing to do. I, <laughs> I played a game of Skyrim, for one. That was my first like thing that I did just to get my mind off of it. And uh, I was watching YouTube one day, and I noticed how many uh, comic dubs there were for this show, Has Been Hotel, that I'd, I'd seen it, but I hadn't really gotten into the fandom. And uh, I was surprised at how many comics there were dubbed for this. <laughs> he just put on the fursuit hat. It's really cute. He was, uh, I was surprised at how many views there were on these comic dubs. So the first couple of comics that we did, I did most of the voice acting. I did uh, basically all the voice acting for the non-female characters. <laughs> and uh, I did all the video editing for the first month. And uh, we started to really get some traction with it. It was great. And uh, unfortunately, soon after that, I made the decision to partner with uh, someone named Crowley online who uh, did streams for the channel, but not really much else, in my opinion. But that's for him to decide. Uh, and uh, the, we worked on the channel for another couple of months while I was recovering. Uh, I was really focused on my mental health and getting better because I had been in such a terrible mental state. And so uh, he took over a lot of the administrative stuff for the channel. And... Uh, got the channel into a lot of debt. Jesus Christ. A lot of debt. Yes. We, so we were, according to the incorporation paperwork, we were 50-50 partners, and uh, he didn't tell his 50-50 partner that he got the channel into many, many thousands of dollars worth of debt. And so I said, okay, there have been many straws, but this is the last straw. I need you to end business partnership, I'm done. And uh, he took advantage of my kindness of allowing him to continue to stream on the channel while he was getting his channel, which I gave to him. Yes. The Down the Foxhole channel. I gave them that channel uh, while, they were, uh, while they were getting that channel up and running, the Down the Foxhole channel. I said, well, you can use the uh, the main channel to stream to if you want but you know you need to transition over to your own channel and uh, because I gave him stream access he used that access to uh, steal the channel uh, which is about thirty thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of channel so to speak uh, and uh, the way that I like to explain it to people is be like if two guys owned a store uh, one guy one guy stole the keys and said now he owns the store and uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but uh, and then he wound up selling the stolen channel to his co-conspirators. Yes, he sold uh, there, and this Got is all it. public record. This is all you know, part of the court case. So it's not like it's anything secret. Uh, he actually sold the channel for about <laughs> two thousand dollars <laughs> to uh, Crimson, one of the other people involved in the uh, court case. And uh, so, supposedly, she owns it now, which is fine, whatever. I, uh, at this point, I just don't really care anymore. It's, if they want it, they can have it. It's, I'm tired they, of it. They don't have the resources to make full use of it anyway. That's true. But, uh, you know, if they want to talk with me about it, you know, this is a public podcast, so they're more than welcome to contact me. 
Um, my phone number is 501-226-6012. 501-226-6012. Now that is uh, similar to a landline. I use a, what's called a TTY service because of my anxiety and depression. But uh, any of the listeners or uh, are welcome to call it if they want. And uh, again, my uh, reason why I uh, am putting it out there in this episode is because if Crimson and Mike and uh, Crowley and all them, if they want to get in touch with me, that's my number. So it's it's up to them. If they want to try to make it right, they can. Or if they want to just keep running the channel into the ground, they're more than welcome to do that as well. At this point, I'm, I'm done caring. Uh, so anyway, a bit long-winded. It took me about 15 minutes, but that's my story. So, Trey, if you were going to tell your story from the beginning up until now, wherever, whatever beginning that you want to start at, how which, would you tell it? Which story are we going with? Your life story. Tell, tell about you. How did you become a furry... Where are you from? And again, you don't have to use specific names and places, but like, oh, oh I'm from the northeast of the United States. Yes, or... I am from the northeast. Just a quick little rundown. I'll go into more detail another day. But I joined the furry fandom after going to a fur con and the walking out. Yes, these are my people. <laughs> Which fur con was it? A you local remember? one. Uh, uh, Port Con, Maine, right? Yeah. Nice. It's not technically a furry con, but I know a lot of furries go to it. Yeah, close enough. Yeah. I had like a half dozen people. That's awesome. I wandered in and then wandered out a furry. <laughs> well, good. Kind of the same with me with brony stuff where uh, one of my college friends introduced me to Reddit. Yeah. And then Reddit introduced me to ponies. And as soon as I met bronies, I was like, oh, my God. Wow. Friends? Wiggle? Friends? Wiggle waggle? But yes. So you went to this convention, you met some furries, and then what happened? I left the convention, went home, and then wandered into more furries along my way. <laughs> well, and uh, at some point you decided that you were going to move halfway across the country. Because I was bored in the state I lived in. Yeah. And decided to go on an adventure. And now I'm on an adventure with this little floof butt. Yes. So you moved to somewhere in the Midwest. Yep. And uh, you worked at the uh, hospital there yep. for quite a while. Yep. And uh, yep. after about, what, six months or so, you met me through one of the furry meets that I did at the Fox Den. Yep. Um, just to, for those who don't know, uh, may not be local furries. Uh, so I ran events for about two years at my house called uh, we called it the fox den and we did a bunch of events there um with uh with the local furries and um uh, about a month ago or so i decided that i was going to tell everyone that i used to be called draw ponies and i made this mistake in 2015 and all this and uh they proceeded to say all kinds of very hateful and rude things about me and uh so the Foxton meets are not really happening right now, but... Yeah, we'll bring them back. I hope to be able to do them again in the future. But, anyway. There's a fair number of people still interested in the meets, by the way. <laughs> good. Okay. Not everyone is going off the deep end. That's good. No, only, realistically, only a handful of people. Good. Well, uh, so you were saying that uh, you met me through the Fox Den, uh -huh. and then what happened? I don't know, I just kind of moved in with you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mainly because the people I were living with were just mentally unstable. Yeah. They were fighting a lot, and I'm like, I'm done with this shit, bye. Yeah, so you moved in with me into the, the fox den, quote-unquote, and uh, we ended up forming a, forming a bond, becoming partners. Stealing those. Ah, my glasses! He likes to steal my glasses. I do. And uh, we have been on an adventure ever since. Yes. We have many plans for the future, including changing uh, the economy of the United States to be uh, more economically viable for millennials through many different means, including affordable housing, affordable solar panels, uh, distributed manufacturing, kind of in an Amish style where 
you're paid based on your labor and not based on uh, your economic output. But uh, we can talk about all those in a future episode. Yes. So, around an hour is normal for a typical podcast. So, how would you like to, how would you like to uh, lead out of the podcast? Uh, well, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, the puppy is uh, sticking out his tongue at me, so I don't think he has any ideas. Uh, we really appreciate you listening to this episode. Uh, we are not sure exactly where this podcast will go. We're not sure exactly where our lives will go, but uh, we hope that you will join us for the adventure. So, uh, I'm Neil Fox, and my partner is... Puppy Labrador. Puppy Labrador. And uh, thank you for listening. Make sure to share the episode with your friends, and uh, follow us on Spotify, on YouTube, on uh, TikTok, on all your favorite, uh, favorite Twitters and platforms. Yeah. And uh, we hope you have a good day.